What if I told you that there was a day that love died, that true love died? Now, some of you, uh, in, in a weird way, uh, that's a weird way to put it, that's a strange way to put it, and some of you hearing love died, some of you probably think, yep, that's what I thought. I've been looking for it this whole time. I'm glad I gave up looking for it a while back. It's I agree. I, 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 it's been confirmed. Love is dead. Parky said it uh, from the stage. Now, you saying that, you, you would say that jokingly, maybe. Some of you maybe not. I think the death of love sounds demoralizing, especially for those who are confused about what love really is. And for us in our culture today, there are a lot of messy versions of love. There are a lot of messy definitions of love. There are people who've told us they love us and didn't model love for us. And we, we aren't sure what, for, for a lot of people, they're not sure what love looks like. I think our culture is wrongly defining love. And so people, maybe even some of you here today, are buying into this wrong definition of love and ultimately are not, ultimately because you bought into this wrong definition of love, are journeying through this life tormented, conflicted, lonely, and left wounded by what you thought love was. Like for some of you, the words I love you have been used to manipulate you, take advantage of you, and you've been burned by what you thought was love. Like you've been stung by people who've said they love you. For some of you, um, it dates further back than just in most recent years, for some of you it dates back to your childhood, in the home where you grew up, where you felt like you could never measure up, like you were told, I love you, but at the same time, by those people, you were ignored. Maybe you were verbally abused in a home that said, I love you. Maybe you were given unrealistic, unrealistic expectations, and by the same people who said they loved you, they also told you you were, you were a, failure, a failure and you were worthless, right? For some of you, you grew up not even hearing the words, I love you. Like even today as an adult, looking back, you still would just love to hear your parents say, you know what, as they look you in the eye, uh, I, I love you. For some of us, we carried that need for love, the love that we didn't get when we were kids. We carried that need for love outside the house, not fully experiencing at home. We left home not knowing then what to look for because it wasn't modeled for us. Love wasn't. And so we looked for it in all the wrong places. We maybe married someone who, who, thought, who we thought loved us and would fill that void of love, but in the end they walked out on us saying, uh, that we just weren't right for them. And maybe they even blamed us or blamed you because and saying that you were doing all the wrong things. You weren't doing anything right, which is just their selfish way of saying you weren't doing things their way. So the person or the place in which you hoped to find love failed you again. And the whole time, you were just looking for, longing for that true love, the kind of love that is committed to at the altar and says in sickness and health, rich or poor, till death do us part. I love you no matter what. Now, when we don't receive that kind of love, it messes with you. I mean, it, it leaves us confused. Um, a few years ago, my wife and I were on a road trip we were actually coming home from a road trip, and, and it was late. It was, it, was, it was getting late, and I had been driving for a few hours, and I was getting tired. And my wife, she was wide awake. I knew that because she was still humming to the radio and flipping through Facebook while I was driving. And so I asked, I turned to her and I said, hey, baby, you, would you mind driving for a little bit? I'm getting tired. I don't think I can make it the rest of the way home. She said, sure. And then she said this, why don't you pull off this exit? And we'll do a Chinese fire drill. So, so I pull off the exit, and I pull up to the stop sign at the, at the end of the ramp. And when I stop, the passenger side door flies open, and my wife disappears into the dark with the door still open. Right, and and I'm I'm sitting I'm behind the steering wheel going. Like, she just disappears into the dark on the side of the road on the interstate. She reappears in full sprint in the headlights in front of the car like this. And she looks up, and she sees me behind the wheel going like this. And, and, and she kind of goes, 
turns around, hits another gear, jumps back into the car and goes, thanks for leaving me hanging on the Chinese fire drill. <laughs> to which I say, oh, well, I'll, I was just going to pull over to this gas station right here and switch. I didn't, I didn't realize we were literally going to do a Chinese fire drill. Uh, my bad. As 10 cars lined up behind us wondering what this girl's doing circling the car. The problem was I misunderstood, right? What I, there was what I thought versus what actually was. And this, this is unfortunately how many people journey through life trying to find true love. Like if we don't receive love or to this point we've been shown a messed up version of love, it messes with us, it causes confusion. And so some people are like my wife in the Chinese fire drill, they desperately jump out into anything and everything that looks like love. They bounce from relationship to relationship thinking this might be love, this might hold love, maybe they'll love me, anything. And it becomes this de the cycle of desperation. Others are, when it comes to finding love in this life, are more like me behind the steering wheel, and we're like, nope, I'm not budging. Like, this, that might be love out there, but I've tried it before. I'm not getting out. I'm not leaving this place. I'm jaded. And so I just, I'm not, I've been through it before. I've been hurt. That probably is love, but I'm not risking it. This is what this, this is, those kind of relationships, this is what it does to a person. And some of you know this very well. Over time, bouncing from relationship to relationship in desperate need of or in search of love, or just giving up on love, remaining jaded, what this does is it kills your spirit. It's defeating. And many of you, know, many of you here know this this morning. You know what defeat feels like because you're there right now. You know what a wounded spirit feels like because this describes you right now. Love to this point has eluded you and you've looked everywhere for it and you're at a point where you're just like, never knowing nor receiving true love is a painful, tormenting way to live. And, and here's the deal, it, but it's not the way you were intended to live. Like you were, you were created to know and receive and live vibrantly in and freely in a love that is real and that is true. You were meant for that. You were meant to experience a love that never fails, a love that accepts you despite the fact that you don't have it all together, a love that loves you no matter what, just the way you are, like a good father loves his children. This week, because we're not having a good Friday service, like we don't own our own building, and so we're not going to lease out Friday, um, th this building on Friday, I wanted to get into this this morning, and, and this, is kind of our, this is kind of our good Friday service, if you will. I want you to see, know, and experience that kind of love, true love from the source of true love, the Creator God, Father God. And in the author of true love, Jesus Christ, his son. Because if you feel unloved, if you feel lonely, if you feel defeated, if you feel wounded in spirit, I might guess it's because you don't have the kind of love in your life that dies so that you might live. Because true love does die. And ultimately... It's selfless, it's unconditional, and the kind of true love that dies is found perfectly in Jesus Christ. And so this morning I want to define, I want to rightly define what love looks like for you and how perfectly Jesus is the definition of true love. Like he is ultimately what you are looking for. I believe that. So this, John three sixteen, if we're going to define what true love looks like especially found in Jesus, John 3, 16, let's start here, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, it starts here, right? This, is, this, is, this passage is showing us just how much God loves us by how much he gave for us. And here's the deal. We know if we want to define love rightly, truly, we know the depth of someone's love for us by what it costs them. Like when I truly love someone, it costs me something. 
If someone truly loves you, they make sacrifices in order to love you. For example, um, it's a taste of love if you come up to me and you give me a friendly handshake. Um, it would be even uh, more a, a taste of love if you um, decided to invade my personal space and give me a hug. Like going in for a hug is a greater risk than a handshake, right? But if, if going further, if you then take out your wallet and pay for my lunch, without trying to sell me something while you're taking me to lunch, I know that the handshake or the hug was meaningful because now with your wallet, you've begun to sacrifice for me. Right? We're getting past the superficial now. But listen to this. Taking it even further. If you then show up to my house the morning after a big rain and flood, and you take the entire day to help me clean out my flooded basement, I'm beginning to see the depth of your love for me by the fact that it cost you your entire day off to help me work in that nasty mess in my basement. I have a friend named Scott at around the age of 30. Um, one of his kidneys began to shut down. His kidneys stopped functioning. And so they quickly, be, they quickly tested his entire family to see if anybody would be a match for a kidney, to be a kidney donor. And when all the tests were revealed, the results of the tests were revealed, um, Scott's dad, Ronnie, was a perfect match. So they had to bring Ronnie in. They sat Ronnie down and they said, hey, um, there is one match in the family. And in order to save Scott's life or to keep him from being on di dialysis the rest of his life, um, you have, you are the match. Your kidneys, one of your kidneys could save his life. Are you willing to do that? He did not even have to ask, have the question asked. For Ronnie, there was no thinking about it. His answer was absolutely yes. I will give my son one of my kidneys. Scott today is 48 years old and he's healthy because of the cost his father paid to save his, save his life. Like that's love at its most obvious, right? We would say, yeah, that's absolutely love. Could it get any deeper than that? Well, as great a sacrifice as Scott's father, Ronnie, paid to love Scott, that still does not compare to the, to the cost the Heavenly Father paid for us in giving His Son, Jesus. Like I have a, my, my son has a, has a condition. Uh, he's he's kind of got a, he's got a disease. And um, he'll have it for his entire life. I would, as a father, take his disease from him in a heartbeat if I could. Like I would, without hesitation, without reservation, no question, die for my son, die for my kids. I would die for them. Probably wouldn't die for you. You know what I mean? Like, like I would have to think about that for a minute. But here's what else I wouldn't do. I certainly would not give my son up to die for you. I might die for you, but there is no way I'm giving up my son to die for you. Yet this is what God does. Because he's a loving God. He gives up his son. He sends his son here to be a sacrifice for it for us. And listen to this. Jesus, the son, willingly goes. He, he shows up here, and he knows this. He knows, the father knows that he's sending his son Jesus to a place that really, in the end, would not take care of his son. And Jesus knew that leaving the comforts of heaven, coming to this earth, leaving the comforts of the presence of his loving Father, he was coming to a place where in the end he would be rejected, he would be ridiculed, and he would be executed by these people that he's coming to and coming for. Yet he still shows up, knowing he would be arrested, knowing he would be wrongfully punished and put to death. God knew what was to come. Jesus knew what he would experience, yet he loved us. Too much not to show up. 
This wasn't easy for Jesus either. Even though he came, even though he counted the cost and he showed up, even, even in the moments before his arrest, this was not an easy thing for Jesus. In this, there's this point in the last hours of Jesus. He has his last supper with his disciples. He takes his disciples out to the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes off away from them just a little ways to pray. As he's, as he's praying, all of the weight of what's about to happen is beginning to, um, uh, to burden him. And this is what he prays in Matthew 26, verse 39. He says to his heavenly Father, to God, he says, My Father, like if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Like, like in this moment, right before his arrest, all that is about to happen is running through Jesus' mind. There's going to be an arrest. I'm, I'm about to get beaten. Uh, there's going to be a crown of thorns. I'm going to get mocked. People are going to spit in my face. I'm going to get lashed and have, have my flesh ripped from my... Like, he knows what's coming. He, he, he counts the cost. In this moment of prayer, he's feeling the anguish and the anticipation. And he says, God, um, I'd, in this moment, I'd prefer another way. Like, if there's, if there's, uh, if there's another way to save them, um, let's, let's figure it out right now. But if there's not... But if there's not, I will do whatever it takes to save them. If death is it, then I'll choose death so that they might live. And as his prayer ends, the wheels are set in motion, and one of his real long-time close friends named Judas betrays him. He shows up with the authorities. He kisses Jesus on the cheek, which is the sign that he's the one you want to arrest. They take him into custody, or they begin to, to take him into custody, and as he's being kind of arrested or chained or whatever it is they do in that moment, one of his other good friends, one of the disciples, pulls out a sword, and he cuts off the ear of one of those who are apprehending him. And he, so it's a kind of a, you would think that's a good thing. He's defending the one he loves. He's defending the Son of God. The Son of God, Jesus, is innocent. He doesn't deserve this, so he's defending him. But Jesus scolds the one who pulls out the sword, and he says this in Matthew 26, verse, beginning with verse 52. He says to, to the one, he says, put your sword back in its place. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think, listen to what he says, I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels like I could do that if I wanted but how would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way like Jesus Jesus was human, like Jesus could have chosen differently. He could have walked the other way out of the garden. He knew what was coming. He could have run and tried to elude the authorities. But he's also Jesus, too. He's the Son of God, too, with all the power of heaven at his fingertips. With the power of God at his discretion, um, he could have called down thousands upon thousands of angelic warriors to defend him. Like with Jesus, nothing is capable of overpowering him if Jesus were to choose to do so. But he didn't. He chose not to wield his authority in that moment to save himself because he desired to pay the price. He chose to pay the price because he loves you. And we know the depths of Jesus' love for us by what it cost him. Secondly, we know the depths of someone's love for us by how little we deserve it. Like the scripture says that we are enemies of God because of our sin. And so, before Jesus, we are rebels and we are enemies of God. And so, think about this. Jesus surrenders his life for his enemies. He loves us to this degree. He dies for us even though we don't love him. No one has ever paid that much love to you, no one. A couple years ago, my children, a couple years, gosh, probably nine or ten years ago, my, my kids were, my daughter and my son, they're two years apart, they were in the living room, and this didn't happen very often. Uh, they were fighting, and it escalated, and then I heard it get physical. Like I heard from the kitchen a smack, 
an owl, and I can't believe you did that, another smack, and I was like, okay, I got, I got, I got to step in on this one, right? And so I go in, I intervene, they are in trouble, and that kind of, that, that kind of fighting at our house demands a punishment. So we, I sat them down, we talked through the deal, and I said, you know what this deserves, right? And they both were like, yep, that's a spanking. We'd rather be grounded, but we know it probably deserves a spanking. And I said, yep. And I said, there will be a spanking. And then I said, listen, because of the way you've treated each other, you deserve to be punished, but you won't be. But someone still has to take your punishment. So today, you don't get spanked. You don't get punished. Instead, I do. And with tears in their eyes and screams from my daughter not wanting to hurt me, they both said, no, 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 Daddy. And, and I was like, you have to spank me because I'm taking your punishment so that you don't have to. And I'd made the decision, and with very disturbed hearts and tears in their eyes, my 8-year-old son, my 10-year-old daughter spanked me as hard as they could. I didn't let them get away with something simple or something easy. I, I made them spank me. And then we sat down and we talked about grace and we talked about mercy and we talked about the love of Jesus on the cross for our sins. And a few lessons I learned from that moment. Um, one, I learned my kids could hit hard at that age. <laughs> Secondly, my kids learned in that moment just how much they love me. Thirdly, well, I think we all learned this. The more deserving of punishment we are, yet receive forgiveness rather than punishment, the more amazing and deep love becomes for us. Like, the more undeserving of love we are, the more amazing and deep love becomes for us when we receive it. After Jesus' arrest, I want you to catch this. The religious leaders, they gather around him. They take him to their place where they're going to kind of um, accuse him and and berate him, and, and so they, they do, they, they, get, they get together, they gather around him, and they begin to accuse him, they just kind of begin to slander him, and they begin to slur him, uh, they spit on him, they each kind of took their turn, and they spit in his face, and then they each kind of took their turn, and they punched him in the face with closed fists, right, they all take their pot shots, then they take him to the, to the Roman authorities, they take him to a, a Roman authority named Pilate for his sentencing, Pilate takes Jesus off by himself, and he begins to interrogate Jesus. And three times, he, he interrogates Jesus. He, he, he doesn't find anything wrong, and he steps back out onto the balcony over the courtyard to all the people, and he says, I, I, I don't know why you want him punished. I don't find anything that he's done that's wrong. Three times he does this. His wife, Pilate's wife, is kind of overhearing the conversation. She goes, he's an innocent man. I don't know, what he's been, I don't know why he's been arrested. And in Luke 23, verse 22, uh, here's, Pilate, here's kind of what happened. Pilate steps out and he says, why? Why do you want this man? What crime has this man committed? I found, no, I found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, instead of giving Jesus the death penalty, I will have him punished just to please you, even though he's innocent, and then I'm going to release him. Three times the wicked crowd won't have anything to do with Pilate's acquittal. Three times they shout over and over, crucify him, crucify him. Like it's a game for them now. They want to see this innocent guy. Why? I, it, it makes no sense. And of course the rest of the story is this. The wicked crowd asked for the release of a prisoner named Barabbas who was a murderer instead of the release of an innocent kind, gentle, loving teacher. They want this murderer released back into their community instead of Jesus. And an innocent Jesus gets the death penalty. No crime, no guilt, innocent of all evil. Scripture tells us he never sinned. He was perfect. He was kind. He was loving. He healed people. He helped people. He fixed people. He was perfect and innocent. You and me aren't. You and me, our sin is the enemy of love. Like, like our sin is a crime against the loving law of the universe and the loving character of God. 
Our self-absorbed, selfish, wicked nature destroys true love. In reality, we are the guilty party. Like, we are the ones deserving punishment, not freedom. How painful must it be for God to look down at His children and see us in rebellion of Him? See us inflicting pain on others, judging others, outcasting others, marginalizing others, bullying others. How painful is it him is it for him to look down and see us inflicting pain on others and inflicting pain on ourselves? And he sees us and he desperately desires for us to experience he doesn't want to punish us. He wants us to experience love. He wants us to be set free from ourselves and from our sin so that we can love each other and be in harmony with each other and so that we can live in relationship with Him, the true ultimate source of love. We don't deserve it. We are enemies of Him in our sinful nature, yet He loves us anyway. And He loves us enough to bear the pain that you and I deserve. And think about this. If you know the story of Jesus when he is actually pinned and he's up on the cross, two thieves on each side of him. One of the thieves, while he's on the cross, looks at Jesus. And when he looks at him, I don't know how he recognizes this or how he comes to this place in his heart and his mind. But he shouts down to the crowd and he begins to defend Jesus. He tells the crowd he's innocent. He looks at Jesus and he sees innocence. And he says this man doesn't deserve to die. And then there's this point where as he sees Jesus and he sees what Jesus is going through, like this breaks the thief. And I wonder, this thief that's being executed probably rightly, because he is guilty, as he's on the cross, on another cross beside Jesus, I wonder what his story is. I wonder why in his life he resorted to thievery. I wonder if as a child no one had given him the love he deserved. I wonder how he must have been so wounded by the people in his life who said they loved him but instead inflicted pain on him. Maybe the love he'd always known had just continued to fail him, so, so much so that he became hardened to life and he resorted to, be, to, he resorted to taking advantage of others. Never able to love others himself because he had never been loved. I wonder if that's his story. That would make sense if it was. But in this moment, this criminal, this hardened criminal, realizes what he's been missing. He realizes what he's done. He realizes just how depraved his heart was. And in this moment, the realization of his depravity, along with the realization of true love right beside him, breaks his heart. And he defends Jesus... And then he makes this broken-hearted plea to Jesus. He says, Jesus, will you remember me when you get to heaven? This moment is hugely impactful. It's hugely significant. The thief on the cross at the brink of death, there's no time for payment. There's no time for penance. Like the, like the only thing he can do is with a broken heart plea. The only thing he's got in this moment is Jesus. That's, it's too late to earn right standing with God. It's too late to make things right from his past. The only thing he's got in this moment is a broken heart in Jesus. The only thing he can do is plea. Listen, that's us. That's us. We're the thief on the cross. You and I, the shame of our past the burden of our past, those things that in our past that we're embarrassed of and we don't want anybody to find out, you and I can't fix those things. The only thing we have is a broken heart over those things and a plea to Jesus. All we have to offer is our broken heart for the sin and wickedness that we're guilty of. And that's not very much. It's certainly not... Um, a repayment for the things we've done. That's not enough to purchase our freedom. Like, we deserve punishment. We don't deserve anything loving from God. But unconditionally, God gives us a Savior who has a heart for the broken and the weary and the repentant of heart. And so to the thief in this moment, Jesus says, 
Yeah, I will. You will be with me in paradise. Do you think the thief in that moment understood the depth of Jesus' love? Undeserving love. This moment has significant meaning for us. Thirdly, uh, one of the meanings it has is this. We know the depth of someone's love for us by the greatness of the benefits we receive by being loved. Like at the cross, there was this woman named Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was with the rest of the disciples at the foot of the cross. She was weeping and mourning as Jesus was suffering and as he was dying on the cross. We know who Mary Magdalene is because earlier in Jesus' ministry, Luke chapter 8 specifically, we know there was a moment where Jesus runs into Mary and Mary is possessed by 12 demons. And she has been for some time. She is being, uh, uh, she's just owned in some ways by Satan. And Jesus casts those 12 demons out of her. He sets her free. This is how, do you think Mary understood? She was a beneficiary of Jesus' love. Do you think Mary understood how much Jesus loved her? Like, we know how much we're loved by how greatly we benefit from the love. Like, do you think Mary understood the love of Jesus? Yeah. But how much more, how much more probably did the thief on the cross who was on the brink of death like with my kids, it's, it's loving for me to help them with a math assignment. It will one day be a greater display of love when, I, when my son wants to borrow the car and I give him the keys, right? For my friend Scott, it's, it, it, the scale just keeps getting... For my friend Scott, it's even greater benefit from the love of his father, life by the way of a kidney. Do you see how love benefits you? Jesus. If Jesus had just come to be a good teacher and show us how to live like like sons and daughters here's what here's what you need to do here's what you need to avoid like if he just taught us how to be good and not bad that would be loving and, and that would be that would be good but but Jesus did more than that like Jesus healed people like people who couldn't see he fixed their eyesight people who couldn't walk he fixed their limbs so that they couldn't, so that they were strong. Like he heals the sick. Like there's greater benefit for the person in those kind of circumstances like Mary or the blind man. It's, Jesus didn't just come to teach us right or wrong, good and bad. He helped people. He fixed people. But Jesus didn't ultimately come to be a good teacher and to fix our problems here on this earth. Jesus came to rescue, and to save us from our depravity and our sin and the results of those things being eternity in hell. He came to rescue you and I from an eternal torture in hell. John 6, 40 says, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Like what, what greater benefit could there be from love than life everlasting? No death. Hope. Not necessarily hope that life on this earth will get better. I think in some ways it does with Jesus. We get better. But not necessarily that life on this earth will get better, but the hope in Jesus offers us that things will get better. There will be a better place for us to go and be. Matthew 27, 45 through 51 says, kind of the, the leading up to Jesus' death, it says, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, offered it to Jesus to drink. And the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see Elijah come to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
That's, that's significant. Here's why. The only access, people at that time did not have access to God. What they had to do is they had to go to a priest, share their sins, make the sacrifice, and then a single priest would go behind the curtain, and it would be the priest making a sacrifice for the sins of all people behind that curtain to God. Jesus dying rips the curtain in half. What's that mean? It means all humanity has access to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the mediator. Jesus is the only way to God. That's what that means. That's good news. And at Jesus' last breath, we don't deserve it, yet we receive it. At Jesus' last breath, He sets the world free. At Jesus' last breath, we who choose to believe and follow him as the one true loving Savior, in that moment when we make that choice, we are no longer enemies of the cross, but instead are children of God. The loving Son of the loving Almighty Father dies so that you and I might live. Greater love has no man than this, that a man gives down his, lays down his life for his friends. Isaiah 53, verses 5 through 6 says this about Jesus on the cross and his death. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we were healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, but the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. True love died for you so that you might live. For today, I want to leave us there with the image of Jesus on the cross for us. I want us to be reminded of the darkest day ever in the history of the world. But I also want to continue this sermon next week on Easter because two days later we experience the most beautiful day 